this is John Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. I'm so excited to share this episode with you guys. It's probably one of the best episodes that I've actually ever filmed or actually got to experience here. And uh, where I am today, I'm here outside Salt Lake City in Orem, Utah. That's probably about half actually a picture of the house and the nice lawn that was existing there, you know, just five years ago. And this is what the house used to look like then. And look at the transformation that it actually has gone through now. Woo! Look at that. Wow, man, look at that. I just see like nature and beauty and amazement. Basically, over the three and a half years, she's been importing mainly only plants, actually, and you'll learn about that more. She actually has importing and bringing in plants and planting plants and pl planting seeds to see what happens with very minimal inputs. And, you know, to me, it looks amazing. And of course, she's. All right, so this is the front entrance to the house. There's like a little arbor here. And there's a sign that says, uh, Welcome to Utah Valley Permaculture and Greenhouse. Uh, so Denise here actually has her, uh, went through her PDC or Permaculture Design course and got her certificate. And in addition, she also actually teaches people hands on, literally hands in the dirt, uh, working um, to build their own permaculture design. In the permaculture design course she um, will give to people over a six month period on site you're you're literally working hands in the dirt that's probably during the uh the season here which is not the winter um to you know uh, play with plant up uh, make designs and more importantly get your hands in and see how this whole system here was designed so you could emulate it of course you know coming to a permaculture design a course here in Utah would be good if you live in a similar climate to Utah. I wouldn't recommend, you know, if you live in Hawaii, don't do your permaculture design in Utah. Do it in Hawaii or do it in a similar climate zone. But for people that live in the Utah area, I mean, this is probably the best place you guys could come to learn how to turn your front yard into um, a permaculture food forest like this. And the other thing I'm going to say is that a lot of permaculture food forests, culture, many times there's a lot of plants that are used that, that may be beneficial to the environment or to the people, um, you know, but they're not edible. And so like my slant, I'm really highly slanted on, I want to have useful plants, but that are also edible. And I see a lot of permaculture designs that incorporate a lot of non-edibles, which makes me sad, which especially on a small scale, if you're doing small scale permaculture, to me, the, one of the most important factors um, is to have as much food as possible. And for me to see actually a permaculture design, actually that's growing a lot of food, it almost makes me think like, should I even have my vegetable garden? <laughs> In this way, you know, a permaculture food forest is a lot less work. Actually, uh, De Denise used to have organic gardening, square foot gardening here on the site, you know, with her dad. And that's how she got kind of like involved with growing stuff. And she's like, she's like, organic gardening's dumb. <laughs> she's like, I want to create something sustainable that I could work less because, you know, she's definitely, you know, uh, more of an elder, I'll say elder lady. Um, but I mean, she's like amazing because she's like a kid at heart. She's like the most eldest lady that I've ever seen. I mean, this is not to like be bad or anything, but she's like the most childlike that I've ever seen also. I mean, this is just like totally amazing. I hope to find a wife like that one day, you know, that always has that childlike spirit. Cause she's always just like, like nature amazes her and that's it's, it's like it's like really amazing to see that in a person so that like that made my day just much better so and walk into her place so here's that little arbor she has a bunch of lights on here and uh, walking through like one of the things I like the most is she has all these beautiful daylilies I'm envious of her daylily collection they're mostly the same type and they've probably been growing and they just divide and she splits them and she plants them somewhere else but it's amazing to walk in this time of year to see all the daylilies in bloom. And what you guys may not realize about these daylilies is that they are all edible. You know, I would just have, if I had this many daylilies, look at all these guys. If I had this many, I'd be making daylily salads, man. I'd just pick the petals and I'd eat all the petals as a salad and make a salad dressing. And I, and I look forward to doing that one day. Because, you know, you could eat the petals and the cool thing about the daylily petals is... They're not green. <laughs> That's right. They're kind of like red and orange and yellow. And, you know, the color of the daily lapels are, are different nutrients and antioxidants, um, phytochemicals for us, right? And in addition, you know, you guys could get some of that little pollen on there on the edge of the flower and eat that, you know, for protein. I mean, that's what the bees are in there for. They're getting the bee pollen for the protein and some of the nectar. But yeah, daylily is amazing. So she has those basically all over and else Hold on, what did you just say? <laughs> oh. 
almost like my coming home here. Oh, my friend, that's so nice. Oh, this is your home too, you know, Grant? It is, my friend. This is your home too. Aw. I think this is the, the prettiest garden here, particularly the, the front. You yeah. love that, huh, Grant? Comfrey, native plants, flowering plants, um, but every in a lot of places she has edible plants. So I mean, right here I'm looking at these guys. You guys could see that. This is actually Egyptian walking onions, and actually these are looking like some really nice walking onions. They're really nice and tall, really nice buds. I mean, here's this is a double bud. It's budded, and then it actually goes up again, and then it's budded again. You could eat the top sets. You could eat the the greens, you could dig up the, the onions underneath. I mean, they are one amazing plant, and the one plant I think you guys should definitely be growing, no matter where in the country. I mean, various. All right, so all along her food forest, there's basically pathways, which I really like, that there's actually denoted pathways. They're just wide enough to walk through, and so she's not wasting any space by having extra walking space. But also, she has all these fruit trees that just have copious amounts of different uh, fruits and service berries and you know like she grows lots of berries which I think is really cool because some of the berries are some of the most uh, nutrition nutritious foods on the planet you guys should grow more oh, and this is really cool I think this is the first time I've seen one of these guys uh, this uh, tree with the purple leaves here this is actually a hazelnut so it's like hazelnuts grow here she's like yeah I'm like wow that's really cool I've never seen one of these guys you think like hazelnuts you think like Oregon or some or Washington and uh, yeah this is just a uh, more of a food forest, all kinds of different plants and flowers and um, things. Here's another, uh, oh, I think this is a, maybe the Nanking cherry. Characters I want you guys to take into consideration, especially if you're gonna have this many fruit trees as she does, is I want you to plant plenty of other native crops, flowering crops, herbs, that will attract beneficial insects, right? Here we're sitting next to her lavender, um, also some daylilies behind, she has roses. And, you know, every different kind of plant will attract a different pollinator, you know. So just sitting on here, just watching and observing, I'm seeing honeybees. I'm also seeing a few native bees uh, come up uh, getting some of the nectar and, of course, the pollen from the plants. And this is super critical, you know, in your garden, right? If you have a lot of the, um, you know, same kind of crops and you don't have a diversity, you won't attract as many pollinators. So, so work with nature instead of against it, right? As much as you have your preferences of plants, try to grow those, see if they do well. And if they don't, modify what you're doing, modify your food force design, add in different plants so that you guys can be successful. And actually, this is one of the things that she's done here is she's found the plants that really work well in this particular climate zone. And I think she definitely needs to have a website where she lists all the different varieties of things that does quite well for a inch equals five feet. And you could see basically um, on here, like she has circles with um, all the different, like the water flow and how that's gonna work and like the different uh, zones and the guilds and all this kind of stuff and all the different plants and the berry bushes and the canopy trees and the uh, understory trees, the herbs, the nut bushes fruit trees and different guilds, um, different potted things, different things in her greenhouse with shade. And she, most important thing is if you are starting out with a plan, find somebody that's already done this in your local area that has a successful plan, that has a successful food forest so that you could learn basically what they did and do something very similar because if what they did worked and you live in the same climate, it's probably gonna also work for you. So that's what I wanna say. If you guys live here in the Salt Lake City area, even the surrounding, you know, a couple hundred miles, um, you know, with a similar climate zone, you definitely want to come here to learn uh, permaculture, right? Through their permaculture design course that they give, because unlike a lot of permaculture design courses that I see, could be an online course, which I would say, do not waste your money on an online permaculture design course. I mean, yes, it's great to read things online, to watch videos online, or even to read things from textbooks, but in my opinion, you're gonna learn best by doing it, by seeing it, by observing nature. And so I'm glad that they actually teach permaculture design here, you know, significantly less expensive than some of those one week design courses that you may have to fly off to some exotic place to do, right? And so the students that came here, uh, came up with to put into their uh, property. And so this is amazing, right? I mean, there's their house. Here's all the different shade trees, uh, you know, the different kinds of trees or shrubs, the garden fully planned out, the greenhouse, and more importantly, all the different tall trees, 
the standard trees, the tree shrubs, the shrubs, the vines, the herbs, the ground cover, aquatic plants, root plants. Uh, totally amazing. So I mean, that's what they came up with after going through the PDC here and they will guide you and help you create your own uh, design for your property, right? And actually enhance and beautify and create spaces that are better for nature, better for the environment, also uh, better for you. And uh, yeah, so I really loved visiting this place today. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed it myself. Um, if you guys did enjoy it, hey, please be sure to give me a thumb because she is an amazing person just talking to her. She's just such, such a really nice, uh, happy, that's a really important person, and also child at heart. And that's not something you find with many elder people in this day and age uh, from my experience. Um, argue that the base that you worked on is very much cultural. This regenerative approach to agriculture uh, and sustainable food systems, which are absolutely a piece of the, of the equation, a big piece in taking us where we need to go. I'm pleased to announce the United States will join One Trillion Trees Initiative. Planting trees is nowhere near enough and it cannot replace rewilding nature. And the devastating loss of biodiversity are the greatest threats humanity has ever faced. You end up with, with uh, breaking the hydrological cycle. Totally dry out, and then trees were planted, and now the wood has come back and people are drinking from it. Draw down atmospheric carbon, and one great natural technology to do that is in the form of trees and grasses. This is not a drill. There is a magic machine that sucks carbon out of the air, costs very little, and builds itself. It's called a tree. Nature is a tool we can use to repair our broken climate. May I ask you, if you I think it's three trillion trees. Yes, I've seen the results though. I've seen the results. It works, yeah, doesn't it? In, in our little programs, yes. you know, we have one water source where people used to go and drink water, and it totally dried out. out. And then trees were planted, and now the water's come back, and people are drinking from it. Well, we're going to share that with the world. Thank you. Bottom land here, kind of a penny plain in the Sonora Desert, and it's not much fertility around. Pretty sparse vegetation, actually. And this here is an 80-year-old swell bank put in in the Great Depression in the Roosevelt era. And it's a big one. And as I walk over the top, then you see this obvious event it starts to happen. The trees get green and big, and the vegetation gets really lush. And this is something you need to really understand. It's not every day that you see a scene like this, an oasis of lush verdant green, created by nature, facilitated by good design. The dry gullies bear the scars of flash floods. Without vegetation cover on the hillsides, when the rains come, the water doesn't soak into the ground, but flows away in a flood. Then it's not available for agriculture during the rest of the year. This leads to drought, and famously for Ethiopia, famine. But just as I've witnessed in China, there is hope that the situation here can be reversed. In just six years, Professor Lagessa Nagash and local villagers have transformed a severely eroded terrain by planting indigenous trees and plants. 
Almost miraculously, a clear flowing stream has emerged where once there was a muddy trickle. How is it that it's possible for you to get the stream to flow throughout the year? It is because of the vegetation cover, which has been regenerating on this mountain. This water is maintained in the landscape because as soon as rain falls on the canopy on this vegetation, that rain then infiltrated gradually into the ground, ending up with this steady flow of this river. Almost wiped it out by becoming reliant on very extractive pumps, extracting the groundwater, diverting the river. To the extent that we actually killed our river, we dropped our groundwater table over 300 feet. We organized what has become an annual tree planting project. As a neighborhood, we've all come together to plant over 1,400 trees in the neighborhood since 1996. But we wanted to take it further because we were also wanting to push a regenerative system. You're not just something that's sustainable, but something that can regenerate itself and get better over time. But when we were looking to what to plant, we looked to the ethnobotanical record. The way we water all this is not by bringing in plastic pipe, but we plant it within or beside these basins. So when it rains, the rain is the primary irrigator of our landscapes. We just got an inch and a quarter of rain in about 30 minutes. Here, we have a water harvesting chicane or a pullout that comes out into the street, narrows the street. That is full of water. So there's that basin, it filled up. When we started to cut right by where the lizard is, we cut the street curb to make an inlet for the water flowing along the street gutter to get into the street side tree and create a basin in the earth between the curb and sidewalk that can capture some of that water. And right next to that, we have uh, plants planted. Their base of the trees are high and dry, but their roots are soaking up that water. And here's what it, uh, that site looks like after about a year. So, we are catching. Really good. So it's going over the sidewalk, running down, and going inside the pipe right there. And then over to the other end of the pipe. And it's coming out perfectly right there. You see the water. So it does work, you guys. Good job, Joshua. There it is, you guys. We have water from the roof all the way to the top of the garden. Woohoo! It works, Joshua! Wow! Isn't that beautiful, you guys? Listen to that. We shouldn't be wasting what precious drinking water we have when we're in moderate to severe drought in Utah right now. The water really comes down. Okay. It just ran in there beautifully. And that's just off one side gutter gravity and literally coming down and then along this pipe through the garden to the highest point on the garden. Okay, here we go. So I gotta keep this under. Look at that water coming from there and down in the infiltration basin, so we'll have to see how well they drain. Look at that. We're getting so much water is going right over the spillways. And right down into the next ones. That's pretty amazing, guys. That's how infiltration basins work. Look at that. Wow. That's beautiful. Couches there, thumbs down, elbows, and then all level through here. Same thing on this side, comes down from here and goes up to the top.
Is our fig tree here. It's three years old now and loaded with beautiful figs. Under a beautiful black mulberry. This is the youngest black mulberry tree we have here. And we have a white mulberry as well. Underneath, we plant all sorts of little plants. We've got beautiful borage right here. We've got calendulas coming up. We have a gorgeous ground cover of sweet potato little strawberries, and then what we call our living mulch closet, a beautiful flat cake. It's just gorgeous little flax, which is great for us to eat, well, but then turn around and feed your plants more nutrient-dense food. This is what we call our zone one kitchen garden, and the kitchen garden catches water off the roof when there's rain, and it comes down on contour and winds like a snake through here on contour, and that's where the water would flow, or you could actually put your irrigation through level, winding through this kitchen garden. The ground was covered with 12 inches of wood chips, grew the most amazing soil full of fungi, you saw little mushrooms when it rains. We use that good soil to build the bed. These are just uh, ground level beds right here. And the soil that's growing in here is so amazing, full of everything alive. So when you dig down into this beautiful, rich, flat gold, You've got worms, you've got all sorts of beautiful living things in here. Look at the baby potatoes. Isn't that fun? But you see, this was sandy soil. Now you've got gorgeous living soil with life in it. That's what you want to raise in your garden. You want to raise soil. You're not just growing vegetables, you're growing soil. Living soil. Like a in our beds, you guys. Look at that life in the soil. You see all those red wiggler worms? This is the kind of soil you want to grow. And all those microbes are what are the microbiota for the plants. We have them in our digestive tract. They have their digestive tract in the soil. And that's the only way the plant can be fed fertilizer from these beautiful microbes in the soil. So we have our canopy tree, which is picked specifically not only to create filtered light and shade this whole kitchen garden zone one, He's also white willow bark, which is the inner bark, which is aspirin. Scent. So he's a pain reliever. His branches, when you put them in water, actually create growth hormone to help other plants grow. So he has so many great values. And then this is six years old. He was just a little tree at the nursery. In six years, he grew this fast. So he's got a lot of value, this amazing white willow tree. So that's why we picked him in our design as our canopy tree. Here we have another cover crop which is a buckwheat. And you know you can eat that for cereal in the morning, but make sure you sprout it or ferment it. Also tomatoes right there. You can see a little tomato that's ripening in this bed. We've got peppers also in this bed that are about to flower. And then he's got these beautiful sun chokes that I kind of invented because in Utah it's so hot and dry. But when all these little plants were young, and I'm not talking annuals, even the little perennial berry bushes and trees, there was no shade and it's so hot in the summer sun, 100 degrees, that I had to come up with temporary shade. I first tried sunflowers because I love the bees and the birds that come with sunflowers, but they weren't as easy to manage. Then I saw these Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes, they're also called, and they grow straight up. They're great stalks for the plants to grow up because tomatoes are vines, but they're also great shade and they're the best tuber food like potatoes and you can eat all winter long, dig them out in the winter. They don't freeze. So you can literally use these as shade. And they'll have beautiful yellow flowers in the fall on top, just one flower. But we use them as quick growing shade. That's what this is. Quick growing shade. I never heard of anybody doing that. Just grapevines growing over in the desert. But I decided I want to have shade here in Utah. These are along here, blackberries, raspberries. We have a native to Utah heirloom tree. This is called a Padawanic plum. 
sometimes they named it American Plum, but when the Native Americans introduced this to the settlers, the pioneers in Utah, they found out about this heirloom Potawatomic Plum. We can't wait till these ripen so we can taste our first Potawatomic Plum here, which is really wonderful. Because of the vegetation in this ecosystem that you've created, because of the trees and the plants, the cover crop, ground cover, everything, you're getting such a wet coolness in here that things like tropical Polynesian taro root, turmeric, beautiful leaves, okay, ginger grows in this. You can grow all these beautiful little plants, calendula, valerian, lemon basil. Everybody's happy. And here's another little carpet of cover crop of flax right here. And behind me, we've got buckwheat. Our lettuce now is going to flower. So plants in here are loving the coolness that we have with our wonderful spearmint right here. All these plants are loving this filtered light in here because they don't bake in the hot sun. They don't need as much water. And the cover crops are holding the moisture in the ground so it doesn't evaporate. And so it feels wonderful in here. It's like a little rainforest effect. We're creating a microclimate. And instead of rows of organic monoculture, that people are just growing vegetables in rows, I'd rather do this. My vegetables grow beautifully, my greens, everything. My herbs grow beautifully in here. Berry bushes grow well. And look at all the red catawba grapes straight up. All this food is all growing in layers of a forest in here. So we do in some culture, we're letting nature do what it does best instead of controlling it. We learn from it and we work with it. And then we can see all the benefits, all these plants and all these insects and all the microbes and all the birds and the snakes and you name it, all of wildlife is in here and they're all balancing out together. They all know what they're supposed to do. So everything works great together here. These other problems are over abundance of anybody. Everything is balancing out because it's natural. It's a natural ecosystem that's happening here if you let all the plants do what they want to do. And they're under the filtered light of these trees and they're being hidden by my quick growing shade of sun chokes hiding the west sun at the end of the afternoon that would be so hot baking on these little plants. And so we can grow a lot of greens all through the summer. A mineral accumulating company growing with tomatoes, giving them a weed called chop and drop when these leaves are ready to give to, let's say, a little tree. We feed them to the tree and that feeds minerals that will be decomposed by the microbes and that will feed the tree the minerals that it needs to grow healthy and strong. And then here's our little thermostat. Outside it was 98 degrees and it's 79 in here. There's a huge difference in temperature. really is. This is what you're creating. You're keeping moisture. So you're able to grow things that normally wouldn't grow, like you saw that taro root. And everything is just lush and healthy and delicious. And then what we do is what's called a spectrometer. You do a test on nutrient density by the sweetness of the fruit. So when we test these, they test twice as much, twice as high as what you would get even organically grown. So we're a tomato was a nine in our food forest, it was a 14. So there's a huge difference when you're growing like nature like this. And then you back that the Native Americans use these sumac berries. This is called a smooth sumac. So it grows lower and it's growing beautifully all across here. And that's one of the 35 berries we have here. So this year we don't know what happened, but something hit our food forest and it started to dry out lots of trees, fruit trees, as well as berry bushes. This one was all dried out and it had to be cut back of all the dead. And now it's growing back. It's growing back beautiful little berries right there are coming up. This is all new growth since he was hit in June. And we're so excited to see it come back strong. This is a native one. 
that we bought from the Native Utah Association Nursery, the Reclamation Nursery, that helps us get a lot of native plants, very bushes and other plants. Something of these wild native plants that grow out in the deserts here in Utah, especially in compacted soil because they have deep tap roots, they actually don't want water. They taste one of these. Oh, they're so delicious. What's great, this is the second most nutritious berry in this food forest. The first one is a sweet buckthorn, but this one has protein, lycopene, vitamins, minerals. It's high nutrient density. This is a great one that you just want to eat or make syrup of because it's going to give you all those nutrients. It boosts your immune system, make it beautiful trumpet flowers. As my best friend, 89-year-old farmer Grant always tells me, food feeds the stomach, but flowers feed the soul. Favorite have orange Google bed with logs in the ground, and it's amazing. You've got cover crop of buckwheat here. These are got gorgeous nurstation flowers right here, which are edible and very spicy. These beautiful, beautiful flowers and these beautiful leaves. Buffalo berry, another native to Utah. He'll have little tiny red little berries. This is our wonderful white mulberry was loaded with white that turned lilac. Mulberries all over this guy. If you look up at the sky, look at all this. It was all loaded with mulberries. So you got some blueberries right here. Behind a golden current and under, look at this gorgeous sky. This is called a black locust. And he grew from a little stick, 12 inches tall, so skinny it's been my finger into this in six years. Isn't he beautiful? He does a great canopy cover as well. And then you've got these beautiful elderberries. These aren't ripe yet. We're going to make elderberry syrup just from this foot plus tall fennel bush. Look at the size of this beautiful fennel. And he's so potent because of the nutrient density we're going to do. But you see how we've created this amazing shade with all the mints growing and other plants underneath. All the grapevines are growing. And look at all those grapes hanging from him right there, as well as right there. It's just beautiful to see. And then underneath, because it's growing nice and cool, we have these beautiful little called snowberries. Normally, they came out and produced berries in December, but we started flowering again this summer. And there's little snowberries. It's so beautiful to see. And there's a little whorehound that normally only grows in the desert. We used to make candy out of whorehounds like this. There was a tiny over there called the juby berry. And here's a goomy berry. Everything grows so big and beautiful here. What normally the size of a black currant is this. That's as big as a black currant gets, we think. Well, not in this garden. Since the second year, every year, our black currants have grown to this size. You look at this size. That's really big and beautiful. Gorgeous black currants. Look at this one. Look at the size of that one. You see? Everything grows huge in this garden. Look at the size of this gorgeous comfrey. Although we've chopped and dropped it and taken all the leaves with each of this down to pair above it, this is how big it grows back over and over again. It comes back this big and strong with the hugest leaves. You see these humongous leaves of country full of almond tree. This is all in one sweet almond. He's just starting to open right now, right here. But look at the size of these almonds behind this beautiful station. Sage, and we have our beautiful mints all along the edges of our beds and all along the edge of the garden. We have a million bees of all different sizes and shapes. You see the tiniest, tiniest one? Flying around, that's a medium. There's miniature little tiniest ones in here. They're so beautiful to see so many sizes, shapes, and colors of bees. Give them something good to eat, and then they won't bother your silly vegetable. So high in minerals, grasshoppers, slugs, but if you don't water at night, they won't come out of the ground. So let them eat and munch on all this stuff, because I've got millions of these leaves. So here's the little sweetness here. That is a wild, delicious blackberry. That's what we're going to taste, okay? That has so much sweetness. Mm. So when they start to dry out a little bit, too, they're going to be sweet. 
So let's try a couple here. They're starting to get sweet. Moshe, you want to try? Okay, let's try. This one's going to be the sweetest one, these little ones here, because they are dry. So that's when all the sugar comes in. When they're shiny like this, they're not as sweet. Taste that. Weren't the first ones really sweet? Now taste that one. Not as sweet. Pretty close. I know. I'm very picky. Fungi doing their decomposing work under the ground, right? In the living soil. This is their flower. That little mushroom because you have moisture in here. That's their flowers right there. And isn't it beautiful with a little carpet of cover crop right there? Keeping the moisture in from evaporating. These are our gooseberry roll, but they've already ripened and disappeared. Sorry, you guys. But we have all these gooseberries along here, and they like the coolness in here of the shade. They really love that. So these, and we'll get a second batch of golden raspberries. So you can see with a hardy kiwi growing up the trellis, there's our beautiful red cornelian cherries right there. Aren't they gorgeous? They're the most beautiful color that you've ever seen in your life. Look at those gorgeous red cornelian cherries right there. That's just something you don't see every day. Most people are like, I've never even heard of it. <laughs> My omega-7s right now on these beautiful 190 different component little berries called sea buckthorn berries. They are beauties. This is our third year in a row. And this is the teenager. No, this is the teenager here. You look all the way up, and it's got all those berries up there. This is the mother that's growing inside the peach tree. If we can create an ecosystem like this that sequesters the carbon and the pollution, it cools the planet down 20 degrees, as we've proven. It also 